super excited today. You know, we have our weekly guest, Dr. Oh, wait, now we're live. I just started talking. I don't know what y'all heard or whatnot, but let's say it again. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So I just want to say I'm super stoked because we have Dr. Scott Munsterman, who is back here again to shed some more light as we progress and grow through the COVID-19 experience. But we have a very special guest speaker today as well, my very good friend, Erin Reynolds. Some of y'all may recognize that face. Some of you might be going, who is this guy? But he is the man behind the curtains these days. He is a sales consultant with SalesWork, founder and CEO. And he is all about strategic planning and growing your business. And let me just tell you, he's about to drop some truth bombs on you guys. So sit back, relax, and welcome to the webinar. <clears throat> Hey, thanks, Christy, and hey, welcome, Aaron. Great to have you with us, and and uh, it's it's time to pivot. It's time to uh, get the business back on track. Um, and we just want to first of all just give a special thanks to the following organizations, uh, like we have in the past. Uh, if it wasn't for their collaborative help, uh, we would not uh, be able to present uh, what we have uh, to talk about today. And of course, what we have to talk about today is a lot of content um, that we uh, want to help you think about how to think about things, if you will. Um, and so our disclaimer is that we've done the best that we can uh, with the homework that we have done and and uh, and bringing on a special guest uh, such as such as Aaron. Um, Aaron, before we jump right into this, um, tell us tell us just a uh, within a few minutes, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, these days, like everybody else, there's not a lot to say. I'm stuck in my basement, go outside a little bit and have a little bit of fun. But more importantly, I get to work behind the scenes, as Christy mentioned, but with quite a few different companies. And I've grown up, if you will, in chiropractic. Uh, I've enjoyed it for the last 12 years now, working behind the scenes with quite a few different companies. Uh, and I've spent the last five years specifically working with my friends at Cairo Health USA, uh, which, as everybody knows on this particular call, is one of the most impressive organizations in chiropractic and always truly striving to do the right things for the right reasons in the right way. And so for a person like me who likes to deal with strategies and thought processes and building sales organizations or looking at things from a machine type perspective, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, uh, it's just been a truly wonderful experience. And I've really been blessed to work with some of the bigger names in chiropractic. And I try to stay as much as I can uh, behind the scenes. But I think right now, as we're starting to look at all of these practices and we're looking at the time that we have in front of us and we're looking at this challenge that was kind of unforeseen, it's the perfect time to take some of the thought processes that I might share at a corporate level and really take them down to an individual practice level to challenge our thinking, to challenge the status quo, or to use kind of a phrase that I've introduced with Cairo Health USA, which is, let's get back to better. I don't want to get back to normal. I, I truly want to get back to better, whatever that might look like. And so we'll touch on a few different things today that might help those of you who are new to this kind of thinking uh, start to focus on getting back to better. And, and my goal for everyone is, is just to get us thinking like Dr. Munsterman shared about what it's going to look like when we reopen, how we're going to reopen and what we need to prepare for. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight to what I may or may not bring to the table and feel free to ask questions as we go through and I'll do my best to answer as many as we can. Yeah. Well, it's great having you on as, as, um, as that individual. And, and we, we did, we pulled them out from behind the curtain. So here we, here we go, here we go. Uh, and so this just recently came out, as a matter of fact, uh, a couple of days ago, and it's opening up America again. You can access uh, the website um, or the information on the website uh, right there on that active link. And what you're going to find, and, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what you're going to find is the game plan, if you will, uh, based on what's called gating criteria, the, uh, the downward trajectory of, of symptoms and cases and, and what hospitals are seeing. And, and what the federal government has done is it's laid out a three-phase approach for states and regions uh, to be able to make local decisions on how to open up. And so what we really want you to do um, as a takeaway from, from uh, today, if you will, uh, is to, to get into that link, get familiar with it. It's not rocket science, um, but again, it will help lay out the national plan and what 
will probably flow down to you um, on a state or regional level. Uh, Aaron, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think I think that's probably the most important piece is is stay at or pay attention to what's happening at the state and local level. We kind of know what the broad strokes are, but we also know it's been handed off and every state's going to do it a little bit different. And every region's going to be impacted a little bit differently. So really just stay on top of the state and local recommendations as much as you can. Right. And then there's guidelines for all of the phases. So yeah, again, just want to bring you that, that up-to-date information. Um, because it is all about getting back to business um, and getting the business back on track. And as, as Aaron shared uh, succinctly, it's all about how we want to think about things um, and, and how we go about thinking about things, the perspective we may have, the awareness that we may now have uh, coming uh, out of what we've come out of in terms of this initial um, impact, you know, that, that this has had in our businesses. Uh, the one thing that we do seem to have today, right now, at least, is maybe some time that we didn't have before to actually think. <laughs> and so um, it's time to pivot. It's time to get the business back on track. And what does that really mean? Well, we want you to think about things from a perspective that hopefully will make sense. And, and so as we share what we're going to share today uh, as a way of thinking, uh, if that works for you, great. Um, if there's another component or another uh, uh, piece that you want to put in the puzzle to think about, we want you to do that. Uh, but essentially, there's three key areas within a good operational system uh, that we want to make sure that we cover. And, and of course, mastering the operations uh, within the practice from a from a systematic standpoint is is important now you're you're going to become a master of your operations if if you know how the best way to do things uh, and and know how that should run and roll um, and to make sure that you have it written down so that others can understand it uh, policy and procedures will govern your practice uh, how those workflows are established, your efficiencies, your capacity of your operation, monitoring performance. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's people, process, and technology that really makes things happen. And so let's take a, a quick look at a, at a number of these categories here to know what we're thinking about. And let's take a look at, first of all, compliance. And so establishing compliance priorities. Aaron, when you think about establishing compliance priorities, uh, what is it that comes to your mind? Nothing fun. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I, I think we should just be honest. Where, where yeah. it's almost everybody on this call got into practice to help patients, right? To see outcomes, to actually have that moment. And it wasn't about compliance. It certainly was about helping people, and then that emotional return that comes with it. So my honest answer is, is it's nothing fun, unfortunately. Or fortunately, it's a necessary evil. And the difference between the practitioners that are successful and not successful oftentimes is removing some of those challenges of unfun activities. Right. And so when I take a look at establishing compliance, I really look at it and say, from an emotional standpoint, how can I unload baggage I truly don't want to carry? It's not why I'm doing this. And so I've got to make sure that everything is taken care of so I can dot I's and cross T's so I can truly stay focused on what it is we're here to do. And that's having time with hands on patients. And so when I take a look at compliance, it's just simply what's the fastest way for me to dot all I's and cross all T's so I can get my energy focused on what I would call the revenue generating activities. Yeah, exactly. And, and I totally agree with you. And as you look at these questions, uh, Again, what we're what we're talking about here are uh, the anti kickback law, the Stark law, the False Claims Act, uh, a number of key areas that, as you answer these questions, depending on how you answer them, uh, creates a compliance priority, right or wrong, uh, for your for your organization. Um, but definitely is a very key base to cover. Financial aspect, establishing priorities. Uh, have you identified or allocated funds from? maybe the uh, payroll protection program through the SBA or, or other funding sources that you've had. Have you taken a look at this particular point in time, your cash flow projections for the next eight months? Uh, 
many doctors that I've spoke to, and and Aaron, you can jump in any time, have have told me that their accounts receivable now has bled out. I mean, they've they've gotten to the point where they've had a, a decrease in their patient volume um, and everything that they had within accounts receivable or maybe almost everything now has been paid out. And so what does that ramp up work schedule uh, look like as you begin to ramp back up? Um, and what we did here is we created a little bit of a spreadsheet just to model uh, somewhat for you. Uh, if you uh, were able to secure, let's say, uh, uh, a, a payroll uh, fund of 40000 from the SBA, how would that be broke up? And, if, and certainly uh, making sure that you do speak to your banker um, about this as those funds get distributed, uh, that'll be very important because they are administrating that. But we do know that there is a portion of that that will be forgivable and a portion that may not be forgivable. And so we recommend that you do a projected uh, forecast uh, for the months of May, June, on all the way through to December and do some predicting of where your cash flow would be based on your current operations, based on a, on a ramp up uh, uh, period of time with patient volume, uh, so on and so forth. That'll be important for you to help know how to use those funds um, and how to uh, plan ahead, if you will. Yeah, and uh, let, me, let me touch on this for a second because as you're starting to build your projections, for some of you, it's going to be easy. Some of you who have worked with data, who are really into your numbers, you, you kind of take off your DC hat and put on your CEO hat. And working with projections is going to be a little bit easier for you. You've got some historicals. For instance, if, if you've been in business three years, you should be able to look back and say, here's where I was March of 2020, March of 2019, March of 2018. Then you can take a look and say, here's where I was April 2018, 2019, 2020. I can look to see, did I have any incremental increases? So let's say, for instance, I did $1,000 in April of 2018, and I did $1,200 in May of 2018. So I know I had a 20% increase. And I take that same number and I come through to uh, 2019, and I saw the same increase in the same months. So that becomes easy then to look and say, you can forecast probably that same increase again this year, assuming everything's equal. Well, we know this year it's not equal. We, we know that. So we know that we've got our March numbers that are in place and they've taken a hit, but we're really gonna feel it in our April numbers. So as we're looking at this, April is now gonna set what we're gonna call a new floor. It's kind of the bottom. We don't know what the ceiling is here because we don't know how fast we can all ramp back up. Some practices are busier than ever right now. It's, it's just a fact. Some practices have limited hours, but they're starting to see them fill up. And other practices are going to start from scratch and really have to start thinking about this as a startup. So look at where your numbers were these last three and four years. Look at where, what you're going to need to operate off of in a simple spreadsheet like this and then try and forecast some growth back through the end of the year. What does it look like? The next thing you can do, and I know I'm throwing around some numbers, so hang in there, because I love the numbers, is look and see what your recovery rate looks like. So in your practice, what was your worst day or worst week in the last month or six weeks? Look at where you are today, look at what normal is, and then start to build a plan to get back to what your normal was. And then as you heard me say earlier, let's get back to better. I mean, let's not set the goal to say, hey, I just wanna get back to that. Let's figure out what better looks like. So doing exercises like this, forecasting through the end of the year, even if you're not great at it, knowing that this is the number I need, this is where I sit and here's where I ramp up. So uh, Dr. Munsterman, I'll, I'll default to you. Did I throw around too many numbers for you? No, not at all. And, <laughs> and whether, uh, you know, you, at some points in time, we have to somewhat become an, um, immersed in it, right? You know, and, and this is a big part of the business, taking care of the business. Uh, and I'll just add a couple of points. And and we're going to be as we move forward in this in this presentation today too, we're going to be, be referring back to some of these things. So first of all, as you think about your forecasting, uh, you know, now's a great time to ask some key questions, which we're going to talk about in just a few short minutes on, on how you need to be thinking about things. It, it is somewhat 
um, in some cases, maybe a do over a little bit in yeah. terms of how we recreate our business model moving forward. Um, in just working with clients over the last week, uh, we've been revamping their way of doing their way of doing business, and I know it's going to be better for them. Right. You know, I know it's going to be better, and so even though we're in a situation where we have to confront this, right? Um, it is, there is an opportunity here. Secondly, that I want to uh, talk about just very quickly, and then we're going to move on, uh, is that the amount of that uh, SBA loan that is not for forgivable, um, keep in mind that that you can hang on to that and it's treated as a loan over two years, payback beginning after that two months, all right? And again, I want you to talk to your banker about this. They're the ones that, that you wanna go to on that. Uh, but then you can hang on to that amount uh, that you have not used, if you will, and plug that into the equation if you need it when you do your cash flow projection. And so again, great time to, to get to know your banker better and your accountant. Um, but these are the things that we need to be thinking about as we as we move forward. And me, so we've got, go ahead, me, Aaron. Yeah, let me touch on one thing just with that leftover amount, that 6,000. I know some of you are gonna be inclined to probably get that back as soon as you can. But I just wanna remind you that that leftover amount is at a 1% interest rate. And so because you have two years to get it back, don't be in such a hurry to return that because at a 1% interest rate, you're probably never gonna see a rate that low again. So start to think about what you can do with those dollars to turn that into a return on investment type scenario. For some of you, you're gonna need that extra money to go ahead and start, jumpstart the business again. For others of you, it's gonna be the icing on the cake, but the interest rate is so low, make sure you're thinking about how do I utilize this to get a return on investment to jumpstart the revenues through my four walls of this practice? Perfect. Yep. Perfect. So let's, the next category is, is performance. So we talked about compliance, you know, time to cross T's, dot I's, you know, what do we do with that uh, part of the business? Financial side of it, which meets our needs today as we have to think about things. But then let's talk about establishing uh, performance priorities. And, and moving forward, we're going to be focused focusing on this. Uh, but, you know, the key question here is, have you been communicating with your patients during COVID-19? The practices that that have been doing that, been talking to their patients, had things prepared, uh, have taken care of business uh, during this time. Um, have they had a decline in their practice? Yeah, they have had, but they've also had a great response from their patients. They built trust during this time period. Um, and so we're it's interesting, Aaron, is because we're at a point in time where right now uh, we are kind of have to make a decision. Do we want the practice to grow or decline? I mean, we're at that very vulnerable time period where everybody is in the same situation. Right. Uh, you know, we have patients that have had the experience they've had. Uh, and as we look at just the essential stages of a business life cycle, uh, each one of these points in time that that in a normal process of a business life cycle, you have to make decisions, right? And so as I looked at this, I know that we have uh, uh, clinicians that are starting up or that have started up and maybe they're in their first six months or a year. We have some that were on a great growth spurt. We have some that were more established and maybe some that were expanding and some that were mature, some that were getting ready to exit. Aaron, uh, Talk to me about this. Yeah, so I, I think when you start to look at this, obviously when we're in a healthy economy, what we're really looking for is how to take some of those um, startups into the growth period and then how to take some of those established into the expansion period. We're looking for those next two charts up. And this graph, by the way, friends, is a prime example of a floor and a ceiling, right? You kind of see where the mature practice is, that's your ceiling, you kind of see the seed is the floor, and then you've got a little bit of exit on the way out. So what we've got to start to look at is where you are today and then what decisions you can make given the limited resources and know that we're all facing the same challenge to start to move on that upward trajectory. And I'll share with you and we'll start to drive this. You start to look for indicators that are um, pivot points might be strong, but I'll give you a prime example. Uh, when the ARA High Tech Act happened and you had 40 some thousand dollars if you went and got an EHR. Some people took advantage of it, some people didn't. Sometimes it made sense, sometimes it didn't. But the point was is you, you had an event that was a driver. 
And another event that we saw was the transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10. You had an event. So even if you didn't want to partake, you had no choice. These things were happening and it created conversation. We've now had an event. We've had an event that's universal. It impacts all of us. So we're all going to be looking to grow. But what I will say about chiropractic versus most professions right now, you know, if we're in the restaurant world, we're in trouble still. And we're in trouble because we can do takeout, but it's going to be a while till we can get people in our four walls, which is where that business was established. But in chiropractic, this event that we're going through right now, what we recognize is to some degree, and I want to say this, to some degree, the healthier you are, the better equipped you are to fight this virus. And I think that's a common sense approach. But what we know is chiropractic more than any other profession helps promote this healthy lifestyle. We've never had a better platform to talk about eating right, exercising, getting adjustment, adjustments, making sure that your body is functioning optimally. That message is gonna resonate now, unlike it has probably in years because we see what's in front of us and we recognize that this is gonna go in waves. So as we look at that, we have this event that happened and now, based on where you are on that curve, what can your messaging be to your group, your pod, your patients that helps you grow and also helps them know that this is where they need to be today? We want them coming into your office today so they can be prepared for what we know is coming tomorrow. And that is this thing is going to work its way through all of us, especially as we start to come back and we start to jumpstart the economy. So it's just knowing where you are on this grid, knowing that we've had an event, and now think about how do you marry this event with where your business is so we can start to push it forward. Does yeah. that help, Dr. Munsterman? Yeah, absolutely. And it and it boils down to understanding operations. And, and I love it. And it, it boils down to um, knowing that that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. I mean, the yeah. way that you were doing business before um, got the results it got. Now everything is a complete do over, you know, yeah. just like you said, Aaron. And, and it kind of brings us back to um, who we are as, as, a, as a root of a, of a business. I started my practice 35 years ago, uh, about two months ago from scratch, you know, and there's many docs that did that. Um, and you, you are the cook and the cheap bottle washer. <laughs> and it is somewhat kind of bringing us back to our roots. It's bringing us back to where we have to begin to think about, uh, you know, all of these different operations and what is it that will propel us in, into the future in terms of improving that patient's experience. And we need to get back to understanding that we're the chief executive officer. Yeah, so this, this this one to me probably hits home more than anything else. As small business owners, and we're all small business owners, we have this emotional attachment. I remember a conversation I had with Dr. Munsterman. It must have been almost two years ago now. And you had, you may recall this, you had all of these wonderful ideas. And, and I think it's no secret to those of you who have been following this webinar series that Dr. Munsterman's been putting on. And, and Christy's been so great at driving with other folks who have come along that his passion is truly around making sure everyone's protected and the profession can move forward in the right way. And I remember he was sharing all of these ideas. And I said, you know, Dr. Munsterman, all of these ideas are great. And I can tell that they are like your children. But I need you to choose one. Do you remember that conversation? <laughs> I do now. <laughs> that's, that's right. And, and the, the, the reason that's important is because his CEO hat had gotten pushed to the side and his DC emotional hat was on at the moment. But these are all the ways I can help the profession. And these are all the ways. And it's, you're, you're right. But if we don't choose one, we're not going to have any of them. We've got to take one. We've got to execute. And then we grow. And we, get gra we grab another one. And then we execute. And then we grow. And so for those of you right now, most of you out there, you're not only the CEO but you are the doctor, you're the primary, you're the, you are the chief in both ways. The most important thing you can do and the best gift you can give your business is to wear two separate hats. And I wanna say that again, the best gift you can give your business is to wear two separate hats. And if you can't do that successfully, then look for ways around it. Whether it's getting a strong office manager, 
who can handle the day-to-day -day tasks, whether it's not seeing patients as much and focusing more on the business side of things, or if it's gonna be wearing two hats, remove the emotion from the DC side and the CEO side and recognize sometimes the CEO might have to have a tough conversation with the DC and vice versa. So that's probably the best gift you can give to yourself as the small business person. Yeah, so so well said, and and you're exactly right. And and of course, as CEO, you know what's our job as a CEO? Yeah, it's to run the business. It's to make sure we have the direction in place to to do the things that that we say we need to do. And and at times, it's being the chief operating officer too. To your point, Aaron, you know, and and sometimes in practices, uh, we're able to maybe offload that to a staff person that we would call our office manager or or you know someone that would be equipped but at the end of the day um, as CEO it's important that we work on our practice and it it the clinician works in the practice the CEO works on the practice right and yeah. so let's talk about the step process here you know we've we've kind of prepared things we want you to think about things um, and as part of the process of being the CEO uh, it is your job to communicate your vision so what are you communicating you know what are what are the things that you're saying to your staff to the community about your uh, about your practice and about what drives you uh, as a clinician what drives you as a business person you know and so answering the question why why do you exist <laughs> you know what's your vision statement you know what's your passion in life all of these should be aligned and in that it clearly defines uh, your purpose and it's an extension of you uh, you know I, I loved what I'm what uh, I go back to uh, 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 with one of the girls I've got five daughters so I can't tell you which one it was but we were visiting with with one of their math teachers and before we left he said here's my phone number he said um, he said you can call me anytime it'll it's my it's on me all the time um, because he said that um, teaching is not a job to me it's my life and that's what we are that's what it is to us as clinicians it's our life and so let's think about how we're gonna go ahead and organize that now this is a tool uh, that um, Aaron and I are going to walk you through very quickly, okay? <laughs> um, but it's a tool that you can download. And then we want you to walk through this process. And it's called a strategy canvas. And what it does is it helps outline key areas within a business, within your clinical business, to help you think about things in a different light. Because remember, we started out this whole venture here today about thinking differently about where we're at and, and taking a fresh look at the business as, as a, the, clinic, the clinic as a business, if you will. Um, the very first thing we want to talk about are key partners. So Aaron, as, as we talk about and think about key partners, um, what comes to mind for you? It depends on what market you're in and what the potential is in that market. So in a general sense, a key partner is going to be anybody here that can help impact this business and this growth. If you're in a small community with limited resources, the key partner could actually be Betty at the coffee shop. It could be truly as impactful as that. Or if you're in a larger, let's say, um, more metropolitan area, it could be large companies, it could be referral sources, it could be anything that's going to help you grow. The other thing I look for in partnerships is what are parts of my business that I can establish key partnerships or relationships with that I don't have to worry about. You're gonna hear something from me quite a bit, not only today, but next week we're gonna go into deeper detail. We're gonna do a panel discussion. Uh, Dr. Munsterman will be there and we're gonna bring in some other friends as well just as a quick checklist to start to think about it as we get back to better. But what we're really looking at here is, what can I offload? What can I partner with? What can I remove? What can I add? All these things that help me get back to better. What does it look like? So for me personally, I'm a firm believer in outsourcing. I just am. And outsourcing doesn't necessarily mean leaving the Continental 48 it, what it means is finding somebody who does this all day, every day, and this is what they do, and they can do it faster, and they can do it better, and they can do it for less. Oh, and by the way, because I'm not great at it, I get to remove the headache, the headache. Because what I know is when your energy is right, when you're excited, when you're happy, it's contagious. Mm -hmm. Your patients will feel it, your employees will feel it, your community will feel it, and your business will grow. 
It's, it's that basic sometimes. So partnerships can be as simple as Betty from the coffee shop. It can be as big as, you know, AAA lawn care that makes me never have to worry about lawn care again. Whatever it's going to be, it can fall under that kind of an umbrella. And economies of scale, lower lower overhead costs. For sure. You know, when you, Aaron, you you said this the other day to me, and and you talked about how uh, many doctors have brick and mortar around them that they're paying twenty four seven on, and they're in there thirty to forty hours a week. Yeah. So one of you my favorite, one of my favorite questions is it's just basic math. You're paying rent twenty four seven. Your rent doesn't stop. You're, if you own it, if you're Renting it, it doesn't matter. You're paying for it 24-7, 365. So what's the utilization of it? Is it 30 hours of the 140-some hours, 150-some hours? So if I look at this is actually open 30 hours out of our 150-some hours in a week, we're running at 20% utilization. And take it a step further, let's say I'm in small town America, where it just so happens there are five of us within a two square mile radius, we're now paying five 100% sets of rent. <laughs> and each of us are using it 30%. So from an economies of scale standpoint, I struggle with that. I say, I don't know that that necessarily has to be the case. We have five sets of purchases, we have five sets of employees, we have five sets of rent. We're fighting for the same people that are all in this one community. I'm not telling everybody on this call to consolidate. I want to be clear. But this is a prime example of how you've got to start thinking. It's just simply, I've got this business. I've got this building. It could be used 150 hours a week. We're using it 30 hours a week. As we start to look at this, what can we do from an economy to scale standpoint? If you're in a town that has manufacturing, a first, second, and third shift, Who's serving the second and third shifts? Mm -hmm. who's, who's naturally a night owl? Who, uh, we work very closely with the women in chiropractic, and I think about this wonderful program that they have where they're trying to help, uh, especially new mothers, get back into practice and balance some of that. So I think about somebody who wants to practice two days a week, maybe Saturday morning and Friday night. How do we get more use out of a out of a brick and mortar building that we're paying 24 seven rent on. So Dr. Munzman, that's just a prime example. We're gonna get into more of that next week, but that's how we have to start thinking a little bit that says, wait a minute, if something like this happens again, let's take that back. When something like this happens again, do I wanna go through the stress that I'm in right now or is there a way to mitigate risk while still keeping my individuality? And that's that's important, especially in chiropractic. Yeah. Well, and another wait a minute, uh, look at the practices through key activities, you know, yeah. and, and you touched on this already. I mean, you know, what are the things that we do that grow revenue, that improve patient experience, that help us become compliant, that assist us in billing, coding, you know, all of those things. I mean, what are all the jobs that are being done out there that you're probably doing or staff are doing? And is that, is that the right approach? Is it time to relook at that? Right. Uh, what about our value propositions? Uh, you touched on a key value proposition already, Aaron. Uh, you know, I think we've somewhat forgotten about the opioid crisis, you know, but we are the preferred frontline approach to pain management. And to your point earlier, what about or how about well-being? Yeah, I, I think this is going to be, uh, friends, we have an opportunity. So let me let my sales brain come back in for just a moment. We have an opportunity to own this next message of overall health and well-being. We were already moving down that path, but we can own it. And over these next 12 to 24 months, it is going to be top of mind everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. It doesn't matter how we got here. We can sit and argue all day long about how we got in this position, who did what, who didn't do what, who started what, what did what. I've heard them all. I don't know what is. What I do know, though, is that, again, what I can control, controllables and uncontrollables, and those are always big to me. We can control how we respond to this event. And if we own it in conversation with our patients and we start talking about overall well-being, the importance of overall well-being 
You cannot have that conversation without talking about the importance of regular chiropractic care in it. It's just there. I wasn't able to get my kids into the chiropractor a week ago Monday. On Thursday of last week, my son, who is 10, said, Dad, I need the lights turned on. This is a true story. That's how he refers to it. He's like, I need the lights turned on. Every time he goes, it's like the lights are turned on. They know. And those of you who see kids, you know they know. For the rest of us as adults, we now need to buy into that. Think of it the same way. And we need to push this. Well-being, we've never had a better time to plant our flag in overall health, wellness, and well-being. Yep. Nope, that's that's excellent. And then just asking key questions. You know, again, you know, what services are we offering? Who's our ideal patient? You know, all of those key questions to help identify and characterize um, the value proposition, but huge opportunities for us, huge opportunities for us. Then look at our care collaborations. Uh, who are you working with today? Um, who are you reaching across the aisle, if you will, uh, with? Um, and how have those relationships been established? And what are some opportunities to even further that down the road? Uh, if there's uh, been one thing that we've learned about in this in this COVID process is that uh, number one, uh, we are recognized as essential service providers, right? You know, I mean, that came out of the woodwork fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and number two, we also uh, have had an opportunity and I think have this opportunity for some time yet to to be the go-to neuromusculoskeletal providers. Um, not not setting aside what Aaron just said about, you know, the well-being aspect of it and, and because we are uh, holistic, naturally based providers that can speak to that lifestyle and the whole the, the whole enchilada, if you will. Um, but now's our time to step out even further um, ahead uh, on the front line of, of some of those. And then, of course, patient and customer segments. And Aaron, I, I know you can jump right in and, and speak to, um, you know, those the way that we need to look at things along this perspective. Yeah, so I think you've got to start to put yourself in your patient's shoes. There's a lot of confusion out there. There's confusion at our level. There's confusion at the patient level. There's confusion at the government level. There's confusion. So, again, it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's just about recognizing what is. And because we're going to see this confusion for a while, one of my, an old mentor uh, of mine, and he was a mentor of mine, not necessarily uh, because he was so great, I probably learned as much what not to do, but I certainly put him in this mentor category. But one of my favorite phrases that did come from him was, no, it's not as good as yes, but it beats the heck out of maybe. And so many of us right now are living in the maybe. We don't know. And uncertainty brings out confusion. Which, which makes us not able to make a decision. So as we start looking at our patients right now, we've got to be clear and concise with our messaging. And I would argue that from a patient perspective, obviously I am not a doctor. And so I do approach this from what would, what would attract me? What would make me come in? So if I don't know anything about chiropractic and I'm going to dip my toe in the water because I recognize it's more important than ever right now, then I'm going to look and say, what's going to attract me? And what's going to attract me first and foremost, if I don't know anything, is going to be, what does your digital presence look like? And how clear is your messaging? So it doesn't, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't matter how great of a clinician you are, how great of an adjuster you are, unless it's coming from a direct peer-to-peer -peer referral. But if I am a new consumer coming to chiropractic and I don't know you, the person who's going to win is the person who looks the cleanest. I want to say that again, the cleanest. So if you have pictures out there, clean up your office, make it look like you know how to clean, just do it. The person who has policies that are clearly communicated and the person who's talking about this is what's going on out there and this is how we're treating it. And I do want to touch on something you said when you're talking about the neuromuscular side. And I think we're going to get into what we call channels here in a minute, but in a healthy practice, you should start to look at it as a circle. And in that circle, you're going to want to look to say, what's feeding different lines of revenue? So this chunk is my wellness chunk. If I do PI or workers' comp, that falls into this piece. If it's going to be um, injury or neuromuscular or acute, that falls into this. And knowing what's there. Because I think that the opportunity to grow the wellness 
is really what's going to happen from the COVID side of things. It's to get those people into what I would call proactive, not reactive care. Right. Right. Exactly. We're going to get to that. <laughs> and, you, and you already talked about it. So just remember that. <laughs> Because I'm sure we're getting close to time. Are we making Christy nervous yet? We might uh, be. We might be. So, I, you know, and of course, you're you're going to see where you can begin to look at things now from a different perspective. As as we talked through already, now it's maybe starting to like, oh, you know, what are some of the resources that I have out there that are available to me, um, or what are the resources that I currently have within the practice? You know, your secret sauce, your equipment. Um, and and Aaron, I do want you to speak to this slide because. You know, this is a part of the operation of a clinical business that I don't think has been thought much about. Yeah. So, again, this just gets back to my love for the business side of things and efficiency. I, I, heard, I heard once, if you ever want to find the most efficient way to do something, give it to the laziest person you know. Mm -hmm. And I know that that doesn't exactly prove to be true, but it's actually true. You know, if you ever watch someone that doesn't want to really work too hard, you'll start to see them get awfully efficient at doing some things. But what you can take from that is remove the parts or be smart about the parts that make sense. So for instance, almost everybody who's listening to this, who's a doctor, went to school to learn how to adjust. But if you were to poll everybody on this call, 90% of the people would say, but I didn't learn X, Y, and Z. And most of it is going to be around the business side of things. So we kind of go through this hope strategy. And, and there's a very famous book, you know, hope is not a strategy. I hope I can figure this out. I hope I can get this done. I hope this thing works. And what I want to more get to is knowns, right? Controllables and uncontrollables. So for instance, as you start to take a look at what you're using from an EHR, and there's a lot of different EHRs, obviously in chiropractic, you've got a couple big ones out there, and then you've got a lot of smaller ones out there. But the question is, is does your EHR now meet the new need? Mm -hmm. Does it meet the new need? Not was it good six weeks ago? Is it good six weeks from now? Can I communicate in a HIPAA compliant way? Can I actually do a telehealth visit or consult? that might work, that I can get compensated for in a way that when somebody comes back and looks at it later, I don't have to be looking over my shoulder because I was using a platform that wasn't set up for this. And only you're going to know that with your provider. Again, I'm not pushing one company over another here. For those of you who know me, who know I've been around for a long time, you know I've worked directly with some of the biggest software companies in chiropractic before five years ago. And so I put that disclaimer out there, uh, but you've got to look at your technology. I'm a, I'm a pure and true proponent, proponent of cloud-based technology. So there's a prime example of outsourcing because you're not an IT person and I don't want you to have an IT closet. I want you to get it into the cloud where someone's looking at it all day, every day, and there's pros and cons to it. But that's a prime example. Your secret sauce is yours and you own it. Mm -hmm. so don't forget that. But it's got to be a, built around the patient experience. And so if you're putting energy into trying to make your technology work and it doesn't, trying to understand coding and you don't, trying to understand compliance and you and for those of you who know Dr. Foxworth, one of his favorite sayings I think he's used is, you know, at times I know just enough karate to get my butt kicked. And, and I think that's where most folks are when it comes to compliance, when it comes to coding, when it comes to billing. It's I know just enough to be dangerous. I want you to look at everything that you're doing in your practice today and ask yourself, what can I offload? Does it make sense? What's the cost? What's the return on investment? And you have to look at costs in three phases. There's hard cost, meaning that's the actual cost of it. There's soft cost, meaning that sometimes there's a cost, sometimes there's not a cost. And then there's emotional cost. And the emotional cost, and we all know what that, that's like, that's like looking over there in the corner at the pile of crap that you know you need to clean up and you stare at it every day and you'll find every reason in the world not to do it because emotionally it brings you down. So when we're looking at types of resources, we want to look at all of these and ask ourselves, what can I outsource? What makes sense to outsource? What's the return going to be? What kind of time do I get back? And what's my emotional lift going to be? Can I focus more on patient care than I do on the headaches? 
And I'll talk about this. If you guys are on next week, you'll hear me give this same example. But one of the real life examples I have is mowing my lawn. I have flown all over the country for the last 12 years working with chiropractors everywhere. I've been in some of the smallest hotels and some of the smallest events, and I've been to some of the biggest hotels and some of the biggest events and everywhere in between. And what I found was every time I came home, the burden of my lawn, excuse me, was pissing me off. It just was. I'd come home, I'd be tired, and I had to get to my yard. And I looked at what the cost was to have somebody mow my yard and what the return on investment would be for that to happen. And I found that if I just worked doing what I love, which is this, as you can tell, and I'm talking and we're running short on time. So once I come out from behind the curtains, why they don't let me out. But this is what I love. And I could spend two hours doing what I love and have my lawn care covered for most of my season. I'm in Iowa, so we don't have a long season. So two hours of what I love was a wonderful trade-off for a whole summer's worth of something I loathe. And that's a prime example of starting to look at yourself as a business and asking, what can I offload? What makes sense? Where do I go? What's the cost going to be? What's the return on investment? Yep, exactly. Exactly. And then marketing channels. And, and again, you, you did speak to that, Aaron, already. And, and it gives us kind of an idea of how to go about that cost structure. Uh, you know, again, again, we alluded a little bit to that about uh, what are the resources? How do you do the ROI? on right. those resources. Um, how do you do the ROI and key activities at jobs that have to be done? I mean, are you the one that should deal with the pile of whatever in the corner or, or do you want somebody else to take care of that and, and let you uh, focus on your mission and your vision of what drives your passion? Let me right? touch on this one piece and I'll try and do it very quickly. When we're talking about cost and figuring out your return on investment, mm -hmm. it's as simple as this. What do you generate per hour when you're seeing patients? I don't, I don't care what your hard costs are. I don't care about anything else. On average, every hour you're seeing patients, what do you generate? What's that number? And then what we do is we back out our fixed costs to get to our profit. So if, in fact, you generate $500 in an hour and it costs you $250 to, do, to make that $500, you've got $250 left. Now you have to ask yourself, and this is, this is interesting, and we have a hard time pulling the trigger. But if I have to work, let's just say compliance, and to have a good compliance program, you probably need to do about an hour to two hours a week if you're doing it right, checking up over the course of time. If, in fact, you generate $500 an hour every hour, and you've got to put in, say, six hours a month to manage your own compliance right, then that's $3,000, 500 times six. That's $3,000 that managing your own compliance is costing you per month over and above your regular costs. It's $36,000 a year. $36,000 a year. 18,000 of that's profit in my model. Mm. So what would it be worth to you to get that headache to go away completely and generate even more money? That's what you're trying to start to look at. So, so when you're looking at cost, and you just heard me touch at this, and here's some come into play, your fixed costs, these are your, those hard costs, your rent, your overhead, it's fixed, you're paying it. Your utilities, your loan payments, those are fixed. They're in place. Your insurance, your staff, your doctor, regardless if you're a single practitioner with no staff or you've got 100 employees, it's still a fixed cost. You're either paying yourself or you're paying everybody. Then you've got variable costs. So your fixed costs are mission critical. I can't run a business if I don't do them. Your variable costs are what I put into, into the revenue cycle critical, meaning that they are key to you growing your revenue. And so you have to pick and choose which ones you want and what the biggest return on investment is going to be. Right now, look at basic things you can outsource and look at your technology because new patients are going to want to fill out their paperwork without coming into your office. I think a lot of you are going to start to transition into doing your initial consult without people in your office. They don't necessarily have to come in if you're not going to adjust today. Now, for those of you who adjust day one, get them into the office. But for those of you who do an initial consult, you can start to go through this in an entirely different way. You literally could have a practice where they don't ever have to come and sit in your waiting room. They can pull up in the parking lot. You can let them know. You can hold the door open. They can walk in. They can get on the table. You can adjust. You can get them out. And you can collect, and they can pay. And everyone else is in between. So those are some examples. Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. So, and as you look at the revenue growth side of it, you know, and it's and it's taking a good look at where do those revenue streams come from? You know, yeah. to your point, uh, Aaron, previously, and and going through the analysis, and you walk through, you know, what are we making per hour? You know, yeah. per patient visit average, um, and then understanding as well, you know, and in in our establishment of a financial policy is knowing what our cost to deliver those services are, um, and so it boils it it we have to boil things down to. Uh, again, being that CEO, the, the individual that is going to look at this as a business, right, yeah. and be able to, to understand that. So hopefully this strategy canvas will kind of give you a good sense of perspective as you uh, maybe re-listen to this and, and to be looking at that and begin to jot down what comes to mind. Because at the end of the day, we need a business plan. I mean, we need a bit the, the business plan we had six weeks ago. Um, there may be some of it that'll still work, Aaron, but I have a feeling we just kind of need to scrap it and we need to start over. Yeah, and I think you've got to be prepared six weeks from now to adjust again. Exactly. And probably six weeks after that to adjust again. And we know how we all feel about change. And so you're going to see clear winners and losers come out of this. But I will tell you, the people that are most agile, meaning they can adjust on the fly and change and adopt and adapt, are going to win. That means for you as a business owner, having weekly staff meetings, even if you think, ah, I don't need them, there's never been a more important time to come talk about what's working, what isn't working, what ideas do we have, what are you seeing other people do? I mean, look around you in your community. What are you seeing that's working for you that says, oh man, that's a great, that's a great best practice. A friend of mine went to Costco three weeks ago. They had Dots on the ground every six feet. My wife owns a vet clinic, true story. And the very next day, they had dots on the ground in the vet clinic because I heard that. And I was like, well, that makes perfect sense to me. You can kind of help guide people in. And then I had them record a video that said, here's what we're doing to guide people in. Mm -hmm. And before they put that video out, they were running at about 80% for their reduced hours. Within one day, they shot up to 110% and had to improve their contact hours because they were communicating, this is what right. we're doing. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So you've exactly. got to have that and be nimble enough to make that adjustment in real time. And that's who's going to win here over the next you know, 30, 60, 90, 180, 365. Yep. Going through that analysis and planning and improvement, you know, that continuous improvement cycle. Yeah. Uh, and be ready to act on it. Um, so yeah, it's time to pivot, right? I agree. I and agree. So um, I want to thank everybody for hanging in there <laughs> with us. I think Aaron and I could just talk all afternoon. I know. I know Aaron could. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Aaron. No, no, it's fair. And I, I hope I'm, to... I'm, I'm I'm throwing myself under the bus with you. Well, there. and I hope for those of you listening, I. As Dr. Munsterman mentioned, I get so very passionate about this. It's part of why I came out from behind the curtains a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm appreciative that Dr. Munsterman invited me. Uh, but but there's so many things I think we can do to help and just things to talk about. And and I hope that you got one or two or three things that you wrote down, because I do talk fast, that you wrote down where you're like, gosh, we weren't thinking of it this way, or we can change contact hours, or uh, I'll just give you one more little takeaway in my wife's vet clinic. A local dog trainer rents out the lobby once a week so they can do their dog class. This is pre-COVID, but they could do their dog class, which then just gave us better utilization of that building that we're paying rent on. So that's just an example of something that's going on. And I think that we can be creative enough with enough ideas that we can start to just not only pivot, but own a message and lead. We've never had a better opportunity than I think what's in front of us right now. So oh, totally agree. So download the strategy canvas tool. Uh, we've got the link right there. Um, it's available for you. Uh, Rewatch this. I think I'm going to. <laughs> uh, and I just want to thank you. Uh, Christy, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. I thought I was going to have to flash in here and be like, but y'all's timing was perfect. I don't know why I expected anything less. <laughs> So, um, we had a question come in that said, is there any planning going on now for what we may need to do if this COVID-19 resurfaces in the fall and winter to be better prepared than we were during this 
recent pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think this is important, guys. I, mm -hmm. We all have different opinions about how this happened. And, you know, if there's 100 of us on this call, there's going to be 105 opinions. It's just the way that it works. But for me, uh, being a kind of a supply chain thinker, what we're going through right now isn't something that's going to help us control the virus because that's impossible. It's just a capacity issue. It hit and it hit so quickly that it's overwhelming. And we recognize this. Certainly, there's a mortality issue for those of us who are struggling with our health or those of us who are a little bit older. There are some real challenges with this, but it's not going away. I mean, it's, it's a part of our everyday life. And so I think we're going to see it kind of calm itself down over the summer because of some of the social distancing, but we're going to see this thing come back in. So as we start to prepare for the fall, you and your practice should already be talking about when this things come, when this comes back, we hit the switch. So it's not we spend three weeks figuring out what to do. It's we've already been through this and right. we know this. So re remember, if it happens one time, it's a mistake. If it happens two times, it's, it's a decision. So as we're thinking about going through this, the mistake we had was being unprepared for an unforeseen. That we didn't control it, but we weren't prepared. If it happens again and we're unprepared, then that's our decision that we've made to be unprepared. So as you look at this right now, you have to look and say, well, this is what, what's worked so far. I understand what no contact looks like. Christy and I have actually started talking about the design of a no contact office. I don't want to throw too much out there. But in a future webinar, I'll give an idea of a no contact office because I've worked through the whole process of no contact other than the adjustment. And I think that the clinic that can transition quickest to the no contact office is going to win when this thing resurfaces here later this fall. Over the next 12 to 24 months, enough of us are going to get this and have built up antibodies that it's going to function much more like the flu. So it's not going to stop us. But right now it's like us functioning at rush hour. Everybody's trying to get on at once, and it's just too much, and we just have to slow it down. So that's my opinion, and I want to be very clear. This is my opinion. I'll pass to Dr. Munsterman. Yeah, no, I actually agree with everything that you said about it, and and let's let's learn what we've learned and apply it moving forward. But um, and this whole discussion was about thinking differently, right? About what's happening now moving forward, and so this has to become a part of the plan. Yeah, it has to be a part of the the how we move forward knowing that we will be in in a different uh, environment. And there's opportunity with that, but there's also responsibility. Yeah. Uh, uh, the responsibility piece, and it's going to be hard to get there this year, but the responsibility piece is we've all got to become a little bit more conservative in what I would call our emergency funds. Hmm. Because I've been fortunate, most of my clients are very healthy companies that have had very healthy nest eggs. And there isn't a single one of them that didn't take a very big hit because of this. And so I know companies that didn't have nest eggs or people that were living paycheck to paycheck or their rainy day fund was two weeks, not two months. That's different. So one of the strategic things you have to start thinking about is when you're generating revenue, you need a hard cost, meaning that's a non-negotiable that you pay your rainy day fund first, period. You pay that rainy day fund. You don't touch it. You forget about it. And then when something like this happens, you start functioning, not start retracting. Right. And this is why I am so glad you're not only my friend, but you're my mentor. And you have been beating that into my head for so very long that when all of this started, I was like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I like to see all of my companies function with six months. And that's, un that's unheard of. But I'll tell you, six months goes quick when you stop putting money in and this money goes out, money goes out. And so this is going to happen again, maybe not at this magnitude. So if we've got a little extra rainy day money and then we've got a proven process, it's, it's like kids, man. There's a reason schools keep putting us through the tornado drills. So we know what to do when it happens. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when somebody wanted to know if you had any advice for practices that were unable to get the PPP grant. Yeah. So uh, my wife's business got the PPP grant. I didn't. Right. Um, and so there, there's it's an interesting conversation uh, because I'm I'm personally going through right now looking at saying, OK, 
here's what this is costing. Here's what the outlay looks like. This is where it's going to be long term. It doesn't mean that in a future round I won't get something out of it. Uh, but I'm a small business on the smallest, smallest scale uh, because I contract out. So I'm in that kind of small business owner, personal employee category that things got opened up for a week ago Friday after the money got right after the money ran out. Mm -hmm. So I'm right there. You guys are going to function like you're in that startup mode. Mm -hmm. And so right now you've got to start to take a look at what I would call mission critical and revenue cycle critical. Anything that's mission critical has to be done, has to be paid. So those are the first expenses. That's going to be your overhead. The next thing is, is you got to put your hustle hat back on. So if you've been in practice 15 years, you probably have lost a little bit of that hustle magic. We all lose it. We get a little bit smarter, but we're not quite as willing to run into that brick wall time and time again. So we work smarter, not harder. Well, now is where you have to marry everything you've learned, but try and find that hustle magic to start getting back out there and talking. I would get to your social platforms that are free as quick as possible. I would talk about what you're doing in your practices. I would talk about what patients are experiencing. And if you can get some patient testimonials that talk about their experience in your practice during COVID and get them to release it the right way. Remember, there are HIPAA implications here, so be careful. But if you can get them to, to not endorse, but just give that... Um, uh, I'll get back to what it's going to be called, social proof. I was struggling there. So if you can give that social proof, those are some surefire ways to start to get folks back. The other thing is get on the phone. Do a, do a wellness check call. And, and be careful what you say. I mean, obviously, we want you pushing overall wellness, but I don't want you making claims that are going to get you in trouble. So what we're really talking about is overall well-being. There's never been a better time. Here's what we're doing in our office. These are the hours that we're going to have. Here's how we're addressing contact um, considerations. And then just put a proven plan out there and then get on the hamster wheel and run for a while. So I'm sorry, there's no silver magic bullet to this one. But what I do know is that hard work and hustle with a proven system will pay off. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, several people had questions about upcoming webinars. Um, so just know that uh, we are working on the one about the no touch practice because several people are like, I want to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> so creativity takes just a minute. So be on the lookout. We'll definitely let y'all know when that's available. We have another webinar tomorrow on five ways to maximize uh, forgiveness of your 7A PPP loan. Um, next week, which we'll be posting and pushing out later today, is um, a group um, where we're going to have the panel discussion that Aaron has touched on a couple of times, Back to Better. So we'll be having that. And we have an amazing lineup of speakers, two of them, which happen to already be, or no, three, because me, I get to be a speaker too. I'm sorry. Three of the five panel speakers are right here. So um, I'm not used to that part of my job, just the hostess with the most is. So um, we'll be getting all that information out to you guys. So don't worry. I got your email, got your contact information. And Kendall, I saw your email. And don't worry, I will get with Ashley, make sure you get that. So everybody have an amazing rest of your day and a fabulous week. And we'll see you or I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.